Welcome to Pigeon River Farm, doing farming right. I'm Robert Brown, the owner of Pigeon River Farm. Thank you for viewing. Well, I want to thank you all for attending tonight. Um, this is going to be the second installment here of our uh, in-farm or on-farm classes. And our discussion tonight here is going to be about soils, organic certification, kind of a wider spectrum, and it's going to be all examples of things that we did here on the farm. Uh, during that era that we were heavily focused on doing vegetable crops and soil management, and I had labor available. Uh, so we've changed our business model here over time. So some of these pictures are going to be from a few years ago. But what we did is we actually did very good in the organic vegetable area. We had a, a contract with uh, Organic Valley. We were organic certified with OCIA. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and explain the whole process, how we got there, how it worked. And it's a very viable entity. The key, I guess I'm going to start this up front. The key is having labor. And if you don't have labor, uh, this is a real challenge. So just be flat honest with you there. If you have access to uh, the labor, you have a number of kids to help, you have some model that's going to work for you. Um, and I still could do it to this day, and we do it in the high tunnel, and you'll see that. But the main focus we're going to talk about is how did I get there? So... And these are going to be real-world examples. So, example here, we did start this new farm here and in 2002, uh, moved from a different location. Uh, this is our USDA farm number. So if you are starting a farm or have some type of farming operation going, make sure that you do get a USDA uh, farm number. Uh, kind of running in the, in the background won't necessarily do you any good. I'm not talking about going to the government trough. It's just that you do need it, and there's a lot of things that benefit. Uh, they're not quite the boogeyman everybody makes them out to be. Uh, the next one is our certification. We were certified through our organic certification. was done through OCIA. I served on their Wisconsin board for a number of years, so I was deep into the integration of how the organic certification process worked. Uh, so here's just an example of our actual certificate that you must have to sell anything under the organic label. So if you're going to be putting on the USDA organic label, uh, that sticker is going to go on a product, you're going to sell for an organic or uh, produce for an organic company like Organic Valley, uh, you must have and it has to be current at the point of picking the crop. Now there is some things on transition organic that I guess I'd have to go into a, a little bit. I guess we'll actually talk about that. So you could have your transition organic, meaning you're past the three year point, you're doing everything under the organic standards, but you haven't actually had the farm inspection. Uh, you could do that, uh, be under that status to the point of you're going to be picking. But at the point that you're going to be picking and processing, you must have the organic certification. It can't be done after the fact. So just something to be aware of, figuring out your, your timeline, your model that you're going to be put in place. And then here is uh, basically the definition of an organic product. So it is a statute. And it's critical because there is serious consequences if you don't have that certification and you sell your product commercially. I mean, you can kind of say it's organic and on the side, farmer's markets, I'm not going to say right or wrong. It's just you can kind of do it. People do it all the time. But once you get into the commercial, we're actually accepting money, you're transporting across state lines, you're doing all of these things that are that you better have this because I understand that the fines and remember this is dating myself but about a decade ago there was a farm that I was aware of up and closer to the UP in Wisconsin here up near the Michigan border and they were selling falsified product and it was eleven thousand four hundred dollars per incident so don't fool around this is not very serious stuff so do it right or don't do it at all well, anyways, on our farm, uh, we did a quite a few different uh, different models, but here's an example. We needed pollinators for our vegetable business, <coughs> and for 
our poultry operation, we were at the time I was still doing row crops. So you can see in this model here we have sunflowers. We had four rows of sunflowers and four rows of corn. So that was done outside of our vegetable end of it. So what we would do is we'd plant our cash crops and then we would, uh, but we needed the pollinators, I needed the sunflower seed for doing our, our soy free poultry feed. So this was the model and it was absolutely gorgeous. And this, this was a unique, interesting way of doing it. And we had very good results. Uh, this is one I actually have some, um, quite a few Amish neighbors. We're actually in, the, in our area, um, DuPont Township I'm in. <clears throat> and we have the fourth largest Amish population in the state of Wisconsin as of this year, and that's 2023. So very interesting little thing. Um, I, uh, this is their, their baler and their horse team. Uh, got a gas engine on it. Uh, Honda, like a 25 horse Honda that's on there, but it's really amazing. I had a chance to uh, run the horse team. Um, I'm much better with uh, running a, a large piece of equipment uh, than I am with horses, but actually it was pretty interesting doing. And as I said, I had a very low carbon. We bailed the whole entire field and I think we used uh, two quarts of, uh, of fuel. And I'll grant you the horses had their own fuel source, but that little, that little gas engine didn't do a lot of work considering how many bales we made. Okay, let's get talking about uh, kind of the meat and potatoes. And the key here is making sure you have pollinators. It's been the biggest challenge we've had on the farm and as the chemical farmers keep moving in and they keep winning every round. That's really unfortunate, but they seem like they win every round uh, out there. And you think that us organic, natural farmers would be gaining ground, but it seems like even this current administration has been no better, if not worse, letting the GMO folks run the show and the people that want to do it naturally, try to preserve the insects, need the pollinators, seem to just lose on every round. So I hate, I wish I could give you great news, but I don't see it that way. So uh, there's bumblebees, and bumblebees are really the heart and soul of the pollinators. Now we have beehives, I will show that. We've had beehives back then, we have beehives now. Uh, they serve real important purpose, but natural pollinators will do a lot of things beneficial for you above and beyond what regular honeybees will. Uh, this is showing inside, I know the slide isn't real clear, but we have showing the bees on the raspberries. Uh, so they're getting honeybees and the honeybees have gone into the high tunnel and they're pollinating. So we need them honeybees to do the work, we need the natural pollinators. Now here's just a show of, you need to know what kind of soil you have and the condition and what you're up against. So this is my main farm here. And you can see we have a river on the back side. We have floodplain there. Uh, I have a pond out here and that's a classified again under low wet ground. And then we get on the other side here and um, it's kind of low and wet back here. But very heavy soil, pretty much drought resistant but not flood resistant. So having a really good understanding of your soil type, as an example here, we have Hortonville loom, and that's a premium soil. So in, in the Wapaka County, that particular soil is the gold standard. So I'm very blessed to have some of the best soil that's around here. And then we have something called Simcoe soil. And Simcoe is a heavier, wet soil that does not dry out well, but it gives you kind of a armor plating for drought resistance. So there's some good and bad. So you have to first off know your soil. Don't try to put a square peg in a round hole. If you don't have the right soil for what you're doing, ultimately it's not going to work. Okay, here's just an example of all the goodies that we get off the farm. And again, it was an older picture with all our custom AWA uh, egg cartons on it, but it's just showing our greens and our squash and, and the kale and, and everything that's here, radishes. This is what we actually could sell off the farm. We had an abundance of vegetables done both in the fields and through the, uh, through the high tunnels. It's something you could do. And if you're not doing it now, you've got to come up with a good plan. But there is relatively good money. We ran a big CSA with four other farmers. So we call it the Five Farmers CSA. Um, it was very good along with the commercial operation with the uh, winter squash. We talked about bees. 
Uh, bees have been an uh, integral part, and it's each year goes by. So uh, this picture was probably taken around 10 years ago, and the situation has got so much worse uh, with the natural pollinators being uh, taken out by many different, different things, but I will blame it pretty much squarely on the chemicals that are used in the agricultural environment. And even though we are a little bit separated here, it's still the damage is done. There is no natural insects. The natural pollinators are in, in a, literally a crash mode. And so really the only thing left is our honeybees and that's a challenge too. So the reason I'm really driving that point home, really pushing that point, is that you gotta think about this moving forward. If you can't maintain pollinators you really can't be in the vegetable business at least anything that needs pollination okay this was our squash this is a squash plant here planted out in the field we did kind of an alley cropping approach here so we put in basically in this case here that was an oats strip then we had the spot here that we rototilled up and I put in the squash and that gave a spot for the natural pollinators the, the the bugs the good bugs we always hope but we did have some challenges with bad bugs so here's a here's a squash plant about two to three weeks after uh, it, in this case was transplanted in there now here's a picture to one of our biggest nemesis <clears throat> and that would have been your your we call them squash bug there are quite a few different terms for them uh, cucumber bugs, some of the little striped uh, yellow and black striped beetle. That is the biggest one uh, that we seem to fight, but there was quite a few different ones. So this is one of the biggest challenges, but we used a lot of different biologicals and I did use diatomaceous earth. That is a mixed bag because it will kill pollinators. So you got to think long and hard when you're using it, why you're using it. And then, of course, uh, there is a, a raft of different biologicals that work pretty good. Uh, you can see here, this is one of our spaghetti squash. Up on top, there's just a little bit of viewing you can see here of... Uh, oh, my laser decided to give up its ghost. Hmm. I'll have to switch over. Up here is that oats maturing, like I said, giving a good spot for our natural pollinators to live in so it isn't just a, a vacant field. And uh, we're quite a ways along, so in maturity, but remember with the squash, we'd have relatively large fruits and we'd still be at the uh, flower stage. So that is the thing you got to think about here at the rate at which it's maturing. Well, once it's matured and you've picked, this is where the labor comes in. So here's my awesome daughter-in-law helping out. And so we were out picking and then bringing them back to the shop. Uh, there's a spare pumpkin, as you, can, as you can see here. But the key there is being ahead of the curve. Like in our area, being at the 45th uh, parallel, uh, or latitude, I should say. At uh, this latitude, we normally, and where we are, lakes, just this lake and, and the Great Plains and so on, looking at all the math, uh, the, normally the first freeze of the year comes in around the third to fourth week of September. So narrow window from the time the squash are actually ripe to that you pick them. You really have around a two-week window that you're going to have to get them in there. And if they get frozen, they're junk. So all that work, all entire season, all the expense, can actually produce a huge field of nothing. So once you have them all picked, then they're brought back. We use our, our big shop here, and everything is, is identified, sorted, and it's all sorted by weight and quality of integrity. So not only is the weight critical, that we weigh them and determine exactly what we have, but the shape and the color. Like the lighter color ones are basically a second. They're not gonna, they're not gonna sell for much. So normally they would not be included we go with a secondary market. Everything that organic value would take has to be a premium or a number one. So that was one of the things that we were very cautious of and 
it does kind of break your heart when you've got a, a number ones and then secondary ones that you're trying to find markets for. Uh, here's some, some kabocha. Uh, again, these really turned out good. It's one of the ones that have done extremely well on the farm. So it's something, and we did a variety of different ones. And there again, uh, with the contract, they, we chose what worked, we felt worked best for us, had some experiences before we actually signed up with Organic Valley. And each one of these, makes up a little point here, each one of these were cut. We actually just use a little, a little like a trimming shears you would have for uh, uh, prune or pruning shears. That's what I found a tool best at. Some people like using knives, little machetes. So there's a variety of ones. That's what worked for us. And it was a whole army of, uh, of people out there picking these, trying to stay in front of a frost. Let's go back to the spaghetti squash. Can take no frost whatsoever. You'll blemish them, you'll damage them, they're, they're no good. Uh, kabocha uh, is a lot more tolerant. That can actually take a light frost without any damage. So when you're planning your picking strategy, and even a little bit of your planting strategy, the spaghetti squash were a little higher value, but had to get in first because they're very tender. And uh, again, uh, more decorative uh, squashes and eating squash too. Let's see, we'll go over here. So this is how they had come out of the field. One of the challenges you run into is mud. So there's different models that people have, everything from putting out bedding in the field, they didn't have a lot of any extra insects. Here it was, this year was pretty bad because we had a heavy rain right before we went to pick. So we brought the mud back with us. So that added labor burden, I would say about 25% more work getting the mud off of the, off the plant than we would have had before the, the heavy fall rain had occurred. Now we go through and every fruit has got to have a label on it with our, certif our organic number so our OCIA number on it uh, that has to be an organic valley supplies the stickers in this particular case so each one were were stickered because think of when you go to the store everything is labeled and it's also going to have a farm safety so don't forget about the biological safety standard that's going to be the USDA requires of you and so that has to do with cleanliness and bathroom facilities and all of that so they have a, they can track this right back to your farm so that farm number and the date picked and the weight and all that is there so there is a lot of labor once you actually bring it back in off the field into the into your operation and then each box would have its tear weight put on there and it was a relatively narrow window if i remember back to this we were targeting right around 36 pounds so one might be at 30 Four, next one's at 38 but that window was relatively narrow so you had this combination of what you picked how many would fit in there and then try to get that tear weight established there because that's how you're getting paid now here's my grandson some years ago and without the young helpers I said this or you know it's not going to be a thing so labor is going to be key so when we would have everything done it would all be palletized and then there's the trucking issues that you're going to have because remember all the fruit comes due or whatever whatever it may be so in a case the winter squash it all comes due in a very narrow window and you have a lot of producers in our area wisconsin minnesota iowa and a little bit of illinois and they are all going to be going to the distribution at the same time where do you get trucks and remember you're at that fine line between needing a heated and a non-heated truck. So that's the things that you need to think about. Um, if the truck is gonna go a direct route from, from your farm to the warehousing facility, that's one thing. But if the truck is gonna have, be dociled overnight and you have an, an evening, by the time you're all done, we were into deeper into October. So the potential to have a heavy freeze down into the 20s is very real. And you don't want to have all that work just to show up and be a disaster. So, again, things to be aware of. We've got to plan. Good project management in farming is critical. That's one thing that I expect all of you to really understand is that you really have to treat this serious and have to run it. If you've, got, if you've ever had a outside uh, corporate job or a bigger business job, 
you got to run it the same way. Them, them tools can be applied in this environment. Okay, now we had our product, we got it to market. How do we get the fields all prepped? One of the things that uh, we did because we do a lot of grazing, even at this point, I was doing a lot of grazing. So what was I going to do? We actually bought in manure. We we purchased manure from an adjacent farm, not a CAFO, and heaven afraid it wouldn't happen. But a really nice run local farm with about 250 cows. And then we were buying in the manure and I would let it compost out for two to three years. So again, planning ahead. And even though it came from a non-organic farm, once it's actually composted out, it is now safe and allowed to use. So I'm, a lot of you might kind of question that. It's not a problem. That is part of the rules that the USDA put far forth for the organic certification. Uh, here's just a close-up picture of that, and it's just simply cooking. We bring it in. We're going to let it. Uh, just going to fill up with earthworms. It really is quite phenomenal. Worms are another thing. Make sure that if you don't have a good worm population, you bring in worms and have them actively work in your compost. I've had a continuous compost pile on the farm and not a nasty manure pile. I'm talking a high quality. I run biologicals. I actually we use biological sprays for all of the enzymes and the microbes that need to be in there, plus the worms. And we use the both the night crawlers and the red wigglers into there. So since we formed the farm, uh, there has not been a year, so that was 2002, so the old three, uh, till now, so we got 20 years of an active composting operation going on here. So I just showed it how it's stretched out, and we've changed the techniques over the years, but basically plan on that, and what you drop today, so you get to get the manure brought in, especially summertime, because there's no place to go on the fields. We normally just have it put in a long roll. We got a different model now, but we're going to talk about how we did it back then. And then, of course, um, I got a much nicer manure, uh, manure spreader. But this is basically compost. Looks like potting soil. It doesn't smell. You can barely smell it. Actually, it's quite astonishing. Uh, that stink is gone. The the natural worms and biologicals did their trick. And I'm putting out high nutrient level compost for feed. But remember, what I'm doing is I don't have the nitrogen. When you let it break down over time, you do leach the nitrogen waste, but all of your other trace minerals uh, are there and are there in a very consumable level. And then what we would do is I, been, I have a big commercial. This thing's heavy. That's like 2,800 pounds. Uh, six feet wide, very deep uh, rototiller. So that makes our beds that we would have for planting. So the, the compost and manure would be put in there. And when you cycle it like this, you have just complete rapid development uh, of the microbial life. Now the downside, anytime you do tillage, you disturb all them bugs in the soil. So there is a plus and a minus. Being more of a grazer now and doing less of this because of labor dynamic in our world, um, I know about disturbing the soil. So that one is a hot political uh, debate. But we, the food that we eat and we put on our plate, I don't know how we're going to do that without tillage. So you have to figure out that model. I don't think anybody else has. There, there's some little tricks and people do it with straw and all these things. But realistic, when you start looking at volume, boy, oh, boy, this, again, if you're going to add another component to it, you've got to add more labor to it and more cost. And let's just take the labor alone. So if you're going to do a, some kind of bedding arrangement, and then that carbon's got to break down. So you can actually shoot, shoot yourself in the foot. You'll starve the plants for nitrogen if you put out wood shavings, wood chips, uh, straw, anything like that, newspapers, all that will actually can really starve. And you know that from your garden. is you got the beautiful little walkways and all that, and suddenly uh, plants are going backwards. Well, why is that? They're... The microbial life is using the nitrogen in there, and it's stealing that. So something to be aware of. So it is a, it, we are serious on mixing everything up. And there's some logic to that. Remember, this is not for corn or any other kind, of, kind of crop. It's for high-grade vegetables. Now, green manure. How do we get that life in the soil? 
one of the things you can use here is buckwheat. And one of my favorite things to use on a farm has been buckwheat. I have planted buckwheat almost every year that we've any done any kind of vegetable crop. So that was always my go-to because it has two purposes. One is that field that I'm prepping for next year is going to get a green manure in there. I can take it off as a forage crop for livestock, but most importantly, it gives us it gives us a home for the pollinators and just explodes the population. And now we're in that chemical war. We need to do everything we can to get the pollinator population up. The other one, and I didn't, this was actually a dual purpose. So example, we have 10 acres of greens. This is kale, turnip, uh, tiller radish, all that. And that did two things. One is it pumped a huge amount of nitrogen into the, into the field. We were running pigs at the time, so we'd actually put the, the hogs out there in the fall. But this mix, and then I could graze the cattle. So we put the hogs out there, we move cattle into there, and then the following year, this was the field that we used for growing uh, our winter squash. And there is an alfalfa field of me standing out in it. And that is also uh, brought into the rotation. So when we take a field out, these are typically 5 to 10 acre sections. And what you can't see, unfortunately, with the slides here, other than our little fly coming by, uh, we have a significant amount of flowers out there, so it serves two purposes. One is the forage feed. Number two is going to be the uh, feed there that we'd have for our, uh, to basically get deep roots in there, get the, the nutrients deep into the soil, because alfalfa is a deep-rooted crop. So we did... We kind of got away from now as a grazer. We're really backed off on our alfalfa, but back at a time, that's one of the things that we did. Oop. Again, we talked about this. So every area, so my grazing areas, uh, we definitely encourage flowering plants. There's a good example of a buck buckwheat flowered, and because of the way that flowers, it starts and just continues it. It can go over a very long section of time, you can get about two months worth of continuous flowering out of it because it flowers on the bottom and just keeps going up and up and up. That's why it's hard to it's hard to crop because uh, when is it ripe? It doesn't do like wheat or oats or anything like that. You have things that are flower stage and things that are fully in the seed stage. So, but I said I'm going to speak very highly of buckwheat. Okay, uh, the next one here, oops, I'm going to slide that. Looks like you're missing. The next one here is to go with a, uh, this is a fertilizer mix that we put on here. So this is all OMRI listed organic fertilizer. And this is what we determine based off our, our you know, it's missing. Oh, there it is. You gotta love computers. So here we are. This is our soil analysis. If you're not taking a soil analysis, you must. I, I, we do that to this day. I take them in a high tunnel. I think it's an expenditure, but it's a critical one. If you don't know where you're at, what are you doing? You're applying fertilizer, you're doing composting, you're doing all this, but if you don't know where your chemistry is, and not the intention of this class here to go into the soil test, I can explain that in a, in a future class we'll go into, into that. But right now, just understanding, getting a good soil consultant, um, can help you. I always say get two opinions on this because your fertilizer supplier can give you some great opinions but remember they're in the business of selling you fertilizer. So more, more the merrier. Uh, they get a, a crop consultant and they're going to be protecting your interest because they want to save you as much as money. So again having that, that balance is really critical. Um, having that mix set up and what your plan is, what your objective, especially when you're doing rotational model and you have plans, so you gotta think about not only what's gonna benefit this year, but what's gonna benefit years down the road. What is gonna stay in the soil? What's gonna be extracted out? So again, a lot of thought. So please, again, managing a project, think about how you're gonna go about that. And here's, I do a lot with biologicals. That's our main focus here and I apply 
all of our biologicals I spray on our pasture ground, on our vegetable ground, I am constantly spraying. The non-organic farmers always go, ah, nah, nah, Bob, I think he's cheating. He's out there. It's crazy stuff. Anyways, thinks I, I, because I'm out there with a sprayer, and they think somehow with organic, you don't do anything. No, we need to get the biologicals on there. So I wanted to point you out here, that is the Omri listing. Any, Omri listing, anything that you're going to put on a pasture must have that Omri listing on there. That's the indicating that that product was tested and approved for organic. Don't just assume if it doesn't have this number, when you're going through organic certification, they're going to ask you for that product that you put on and the Omri listing. And if it is not listed properly, you could have a crop that's not sellable under the organic certification. Key component. Do not forget that. Keep that in mind. So question everything, but that one is specific. I've seen a number of farmers get burned on this. They put something on, they didn't check it, and the certifier wouldn't allow that crop. Oops, that's a many thousands or tens of thousand dollar mistake. And it's too late to deal with it after the fact. Uh, there I am out spraying, spraying, spraying. I start off and spraying in April, May, and I'll be, even like on the past year, I'll be spraying up till October. So we have a variety of the formulas that we put in for another class another day. But it's the model that I have, and then I said we had the fertilizer you've seen before that was actually broadcasted that's a that's a, a solid fertilizer but that's done typically maybe once a year depending on what the needs are uh, this is what I was talking about earlier so this is diatomaceous earth uh, we are using that as a we use it never our feed for our poultry it's used this is a really good way to deal with in insects because it does kill insects very efficiently because they basically die from the inside when they're trying to clean themselves off from the uh, dealing with the diatomaceous earth but flip side is it also kill a bee as much as it will a squash bug so your strategy of how you're going to go about it when you're going to go about it um, we try to get this on only before we have any flowering whatsoever and in that early stages it works really well. Later on, we may have to go with some other biologicals that are not harmful to bees. But it is pretty darn effective. Uh, I just threw the slide in here, and this is where we're doing with uh, um, basically kelp, a kelp mix, so dried seaweed meal. Uh, this is incredibly good to get nutrients in. It's one of the models that I use, so it's one of the items that I actually put a fair amount. It's pricey. They don't give that stuff away. So it's everything from our animal feed all the way up to putting it onto our, onto our seed beds for the high value uh, vegetables. Okay, then here's uh, you're getting these pictures of yesteryear. I've got a lot done since then, but putting up a high ton. I guess if I were to say, if I think there's a way that you could make money in the farming vegetable business, I'll have to pretty much give it to having a high ton. I think the model is. I think if you guy had plenty of labor so husband wife couple kids or availability of, of people to help four high tunnels say 430 by 96 and around five acres of land I think you could earn a uh, you could earn a living on it it's been a lot of work but it, it's so the actually the high tunnels to me are the high intensity if they're on good soil you put a lot into that soil so building the high tunnels are, are key. So this is our very first one going up way back in the day. That was a lot of years ago now. So this was going up. Now we have three of them all tied with a layer barn and all that. But uh, getting these up and getting them utilized. So here's some pictures. And it's remember, it's small volume here, but very high value. So a little difference where the squash was all field crop, and it was a totally different model. It was a totally different model. So we're looking at volume. A lower margin here we're looking at a uh, much higher margin but much lower volume so you can see we're dealing with more leafy greens in here we did have some local markets that worked pretty good I'm still into this so this is the area that I've continued on so after we're done here tonight uh, I know it's gonna be a little dark but we'll go out for a, um, a little quick tour here I'll show you what we have and here we have spinach 
and you can see the spinach doing fabulous, fabulous, fabulous in there. And that's what every year looks like. So um, over the over time, you get better and better at it. You can see a, variety, a nice variety here. We're trying a few things. So a lot of this was for the CSA. So the CSA model worked very well. We're early on everything. We can get the right about them. So you can pretty much predict how many CSA boxes you're going to have, what we were going to be delivering of one of being 20% of the operation for medium-sized CSA. It was pretty good size. And then we did some experimenting, something I've actually had relatively good luck, but it is time, it consumes, give me time, it, it's a space, it used up a lot of space. So any of your squashes added specifically sweet corn. We've done a lot of inside sweet corn. It is, it's a real high value and you're going to be a month ahead of the outside and it's going to be really good. There's a couple tricks that I actually did a YouTube short on that recently about showing the technique of tapping the, the stalks uh, right at the optimum time to pollinate them. But we've had good luck with the sweet corn in there, as you can see here. And then we've co-mingled them with, uh, uh, this is cucumbers in this particular, no, oh, sorry, that's squash, squash in this particular case. And then we have uh, a few pollinators, always throw a couple uh, really good, high quality pollinating feeders in there. Uh, the other one too is uh, pickles and dill. So we've been using the cattle panels here and then planting the dill and trying to get the timing on it. That's gone really well both with the, when we had the CSA and also for the farmer's market. Uh, here's peppers and I want to specifically show the drip irrigation. One of the things we've learned over the years is sprinklers and all that don't work. We've gone with the, the drip, drip tape style drip irrigation, manifolds, pressure regulators, I have automatic feeders now, so you know even this year, as I said we're still running the high tunnels at a really large scale at this point. Uh, but it's all on timers; it's well thought out. Uh, for when the fertilizer goes in, management, but it really can, helps control the weeds because other than that zone there where the water is, out here uh, is not going to be anything for as far as weed pressure to speak of. Uh, here is with our raspberries, another very successful growing in there and in our different vegetable crop. This is getting kind of late, late in the year. And you can see here um, our, our raspberries. Uh, raspberries, have, we've been doing phenomenal. Oh, this is just another picture of our, our CSA box here with radishes and carrots and all that. So and then um, I, if I was too do this again, this was a relatively good way, but the key there is make sure you got that labor part figured out. Uh, next one we have here, this is something we've grown, it's been good, but this is a long lead, is we have hazelnuts. We've got actually a lot of hazelnuts. We picked these by the many, many bushel. Um, I've got, I guess, about a thousand, thousand plants that are mature. They're getting on now, this, this year of 2023, they're getting on around, uh, they're getting on 12 to 15 years old. So production is at it, it's actually at its peak. So you can see here, these are all hazelnuts there. We'll be picking actually right now from this time of the year in about another two to three weeks. So here's just a big cattle tank full of one short section of, uh, uh, drying was one of the problems. One of the things we always were challenged with the hazelnuts is some are fully ready to drop out of the pods, out of their, out of their pods and other ones are still at the green stage. So it's one of the things that they don't ripen uniformly. So if you're thinking apples, another thing that usually are pretty darn uniform. These have about a, a 30 day window. Uh, so we've tried different things for drying them and so on. Uh, one is I've, I've kind of come to the conclusion we just have to pick them when they're drying. Most of the drying techniques haven't been real successful. <clears throat> okay, this is again dating myself back some years ago. The 300 quarts of raspberries we got out of the high tunnel and they also had all the other vegetables in there. So again, we, and they, they produce for such a long period of time, we've actually done raspberry picking in the high tunnel when we got snow flurries starting outside and, and we have to do some covering at that point, but we actually had that good luck. So it's been good for us. And I always brag, I mean, raspberries are, are so crazy healthy for you. So something to keep in mind. Uh, here's just showing a little salad bowl. This was kind of like doing your, uh, uh, Twitter or X, what it's called now, but uh, showing your food and all them funny, funky things. But yeah, this is uh, right off. This is our, our diet right here. 
Uh, last but not least, I want to go into it. Uh, we do the pastured poultry. That's really kind of turned into our main, you know, our main areas of business now. So our chicken mobile out on pasture again from some years ago, and then here the utilizing overwintering. Our birds are overwintered in the high tunnel. It is a magical deal. We've got 90 days from the time the birds are out of there to you pick your first crop. So especially greens and stuff like that. So uh, now that we got three high tunnels, I got my management really dialed in when we start backing the birds out. But starting November until like February, early March, uh, the birds will be in a high tunnel and slowly be worked out of there by, usually by April, they're no longer in. But that's dual purposing. So we've got the chickens, layers, these are meat, uh, meat birds. Layers are in there all winter long and we're producing food all summer. But remember, there's that fine line, so you gotta make sure that you got the pathogen thing figured out. So when the birds are moved out, I don't have any pictures of it. We, we condition that soil, we rototill the heck out of it. We don't leave any, any chance of anything for a salamella on any of that. So we make sure that we're very cautious and then we follow that 90 day rule. Well, anyways, I want to thank you all. I know uh, uh, another kind of long one. Uh, um, everybody's had probably a full day. Appreciate you showing up. I hope you really got something out of this. I know these are just little short ones, kind of a quick thing you can do in the evening here without going to a full-blown class. We'll be having some more of these coming up. Um, I will, when you go out for a little walk here, if you do have any questions, um, I know there's a couple in the back there. <clears throat> we'll catch them. Uh, once we're done here, uh, I know I appreciate you being uh, patient and uh, I will kind of because I can actually go out and show you some of the things. So uh, again, I want to thank you very much for coming over. Uh, we'll have a few, there's some beverages in the back, so go ahead and uh, take advantage of that. And I uh, thank you and we'll, uh, I guess that's it for the class. Okay.